Love, the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel, Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. great to have you with us as together we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. This broadcast is reaching across the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. If you would like to partner with us to take the whole book to the whole world, please consider making a donation. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab your Bible and let's dig in. Well, good day to you. My name is Sean and I'm the pastor here at Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. I'm so glad that you are here with us. You might be fellowshipping with us through broadcast, but we consider you an important member of our Calvary Chapel Birmingham family. So it's good to have you with us. While you're here, do me a favor, and if you haven't already, click subscribe and ring that bell so that you are notified whenever a new video is posted. Also, if you could share this video with your friends and family, that would help us to put faithful Bible teaching into the hands of even more people. I know that many of you give when you are able to attend church, but please continue to give to the church even when you are unable to be here in person with us. Being a small church, giving tends to be small in amount and, well, sparse. But if you don't give, we can't afford rent, we can't afford utilities, and we will be unable to broadcast as we do. Without being here at the church, there are several ways you can give. You can give by mail, either set up an automatic uh, contributions through your bank or perhaps a bill pay service, or you can mail it directly here. Our address is Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, 1738 Morgan Park Road, Pelham, Alabama, 35124. Checks can be made out to Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Or you can give online at www.calvarybirmingham.com. In the menu at the top of the page, just click on giving and it will take you to a page where you can give a one-time gift or you can commit to a scheduled gift. Please pray about giving into this ministry so we can continue to faithfully teach God's Word as we have always done. All right, so today we're moving into chapter 10 of this Gospel of Matthew. If you've been keeping up, then you know that about for the past four weeks in chapters 8 and 9, Matthew has described some of Jesus' miracles for us. From the start of chapter 8 to where we are in chapter 9, those miracles have included the healing of a leper, the healing of the servant of a Roman centurion, the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, the calming of the sea, the healing of two demon-possessed men, the forgiving of and the healing of a paralytic man. And last week we saw the healing of an outcast woman. Also the daughter of a synagogue ruler was raised from the dead. Sight was restored to two blind men. A demon was cast out of another man. And that allowed him to speak again. And the crowds were growing seeing all this going on, along with Jesus' fame was increasing. But the religious elite of Israel, that is the Pharisees, the scribes, the priests, and the Sadducees, were feeling threatened by this. They were beginning to plot and to try to stir up division among the people and doubt among Jesus' own disciples. And they were developing the charges which they would eventually bring against him. So things were beginning to turn, and opposition was growing. It started when Jesus healed the demon-possessed men. A, a report was taken back to the city, and the people came to Jesus and begged him to leave. We then saw glimpses of this opposition through chapter 9, 
with his forgiving the sins of the paralytic. Uh, the scribes accused him of blasphemy because he claimed to do what only God can do. Then with Jesus sitting at a feast with tax collectors and sinners, the Pharisees claimed that Jesus was like the company he kept. That is, Jesus must be immoral. Following that, the disciples of John and of the Pharisees asked Jesus why his disciples do not fast as they do. They accuse him of impiety and of leading others into iniquity. And then near the end of chapter 9, Jesus is accused of being in league with the devil. Now, there are other charges that they would develop against Jesus as time continued to move on. But the miracles and accusations of the last few chapters were also punctuated with discipleship sections. In chapter 8, Jesus warned that a disciple must count the cost of following him. You know, as Jesus' popularity grew, there were many would-be disciples who wanted to follow him. However, as opposition began and then increased, they fell away rather than pay the price. Jesus wanted disciples who understood the cost of following him, not who were just riding high on emotion. In chapter 9, Matthew the tax collector was called by Jesus to be a disciple. And then Jesus was at Matthew's house dining with tax collectors and sinners, probably friends of Matthew. The Pharisees questioned why Jesus would surround him with with such immoral people. And Jesus explained that he did not come to invite people who were so satisfied in themselves that they were convinced they don't need any help. Jesus came to invite people who were conscious of their sin and desperately aware of their need for a Savior. Also in chapter 9, when responding to accusations of impiety, Jesus explained that he came to give that he came to give spiritual joy and bring wholeness. The chapter then ended with Jesus telling his disciples that the harvest requires workers, and that is a call that all Christians participate in. The work of salvation could be accomplished only by Jesus Christ, and he did it alone. But the witness of this salvation could only be accomplished by his people, those who have trusted him and been saved. The king needed ambassadors to carry on the message. He told his disciples to pray for those who would labor in the calling, and his disciples' prayers were answered. They themselves, after Jesus' ascension into heaven, went to work spreading the gospel, and as people were saved, they also joined in the work. And so it went through the years, down the line. God still seeks laborers for the harvest. Here in chapter 10, we will see Jesus sending his disciples out. But before that, Jesus encouraged them and prepared them in a sermon. And in this sermon, Jesus had something to say to all of his servants, past, present, and future. Even speaking about conditions during the future time of the tribulation. So that's a quick review of where we've been and a preview of where we're going. But first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this brand new morning, for the breath you have placed in our lungs, the beating of our hearts. You are truly the living God, compassionate, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. We ask as we enter into the study of your written word that you would give us wisdom and grant us understanding. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Start with verse 1, Matthew chapter 10, starting verse 1 says, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the twelve apostles are these, first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Levius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And when? That, those two words let us know that there is time that has passed. The Greek word for called here is the expected word for calling a group to approach or to come near. So we should note that the calling that is in this verse is not the initial calling when Jesus met and said to the disciples, follow me. So this is like at other times, um, Jesus calling for his disciples to 
assemble around him. Before we continue on, let's consider what, what a disciple is. It's the Greek word uh, materes, meaning disciple, that is the lemma or that is the dictionary word. Uh, the manuscript word is materas, and the root of the word is montano, meaning to learn. So then, put simply, a disciple is a learner, someone who follows a teacher and learns from said teacher. And we tend to think of the twelve, but the case is Jesus had many disciples. Uh, there were some who were just along for the ride. John 6 says that when things became difficult, many turned back. But there were also those who were truly converted, and, and they continued to follow Jesus. Out of the larger group of disciples, Jesus selected a smaller group of 12 men, and these Matthew here refers to as apostles. And we see this word used first here in verse 2, and it is a rare word in the Gospels, but it's used more often in Acts and, of course, in the epistles. It's the Greek word apostolos, which speaks of a messenger sent forth on a mission. It's not a word that was limited to the Bible or even Christianity. The word was used by Greeks for personal representatives of the king, ambassadors who functioned with the king's authority. Because the apostle was the personal messenger of the king on a mission given him by the king to make light of the king's envoys, the king's apostles, was to be in danger of the penalty of insubordination. Not every disciple of Christ was an apostle. A person had to meet certain qualifications. Acts 21 tells us that an apostle must have seen Jesus resurrected, which the apostles did, including Paul, who, like the others, also fellowshiped with him. Also, as confirmed by Ephesians 4, an apostle had to be chosen by the Lord. Now, of course, listed here, but later excluded from being an apostle is Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus and killed himself. Acts 1 records that the apostles later selected a replacement, 12th apostle, by lot, choosing Mattias. Some say this was misguided and, the, and that the Lord intended for Paul to be that replacement. I don't think we can conclude that Mattias' selection was wrong because the Bible does not, it doesn't really indicate that. In fact, Mattias is not mentioned anymore, neither positively or negatively after Acts chapter 1. Paul is included in the epistles as an apostle, and that causes confusion to some who, who say there could have only been 12 apostles during the New Testament period. So is it Paul or is it Matthias? If we say, well, there were 12 tribes of, of Israel and God intended that there be 12 apostles, then, well, that's actually kind of a misguided thought because there were actually a baker's dozen tribe. There were actually 13. Remember that the tribe that would be uh, Joseph was divided between his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. But when the tribes are listed, they're always listed as 12. Even when one like Dan or Levi is left out of the list, because there is an alternating use of Joseph or Manasseh or Ephraim. So it's not unusual that there should be 13 apostles, but only 12 that we actually hear anything about in Scripture. In fact, rather than unusual, it's actually pretty consistent. Now, there are not apostles today. There are those who have elected themselves apostles and then go on calling themselves apostles, but they are illegitimate apostles. It's true, according to the text of Hebrews 3, that all believers partake in the calling with a commission to represent the Lord and deliver His message. However, no believer today can honestly claim to be an apostle. No one today can claim to be an apostle because of the text of 1 Peter 1. None of us have seen the risen Christ. Now, many of the self-proclaimed apostles of today try to claim that they have been taken up to heaven and have seen and even talked 
to Jesus. But when you look closely at their claims, their proclamations, their supposed prophecies, we find that they all come up false. They contradict the Bible and they're altogether lacking. This is not surprising because being willing to deceive Christians, they must have not have the relationship with the Lord that they actually claim to have. But it's okay. The true apostles of the New Testament faithfully performed the duty that was given to them. And the work of the apostles has been accomplished. And that office is now closed in favor of those offices God created to operate in the context of what people often call the church age, speaking of the time that we are now in. As Ephesians 2 says, the apostles laid the foundation of the church and having accomplished their mission, they passed from the scene. These true apostles, the apostles spoken of in scripture, were given special power and authority from Christ to perform miracles. And these miracles, as Hebrews 2 points out, were a part of their official credentials, paralleling Jesus' miracles, healing the sick, cleansing lepers, casting out demons, and even raising the dead. So the apostles, whose calling it was to lay the foundations for the church, represented the king in words and in miracles. Now, plenty of teachers will say that is exactly what our calling is today. And we should be seeing these same works done today. So they would say when miracles are not happening, that must be a failure of Christians and a lack of faith. That whole idea is false. It is easily seen in scripture that the office of the apostle was closed when the last of the 12 died. And having read through this list of the 12, there are a few facts that stand out. First of all, they were not just ordinary men. They were very ordinary men. They were not wealthy. Most of them had no academic background. They did not hold any high position in society. Jesus could have selected men who were like that, but Jesus instead chose ordinary people. And the same holds true today. Jesus does not discriminate, discriminate against the educated, the wealthy, or popular, but, but people do discriminate against Jesus. And it's often the case that as 1 Corinthians 1 says, it is the foolish, the weak, the base, and the despised who come to Christ accepting his calling. The flesh wants to glory in itself, but God has ordained a gospel that does not appeal to the flesh and that to the high and mighty actually appears to be quite foolish. Jesus chooses people who have nothing to offer him so that what is done through them brings glory to God. Another striking fact about the twelve is the diversity of the group. We have Matthew, the tax collector, who, because of his occupation, was considered a traitor by most Israelites. His presence as a disciple did nothing to further Jesus' popularity. And with Matthew, there was Simon, whom Luke 6 calls Zelotes, or Zealot, and here in verse 4 is called uh, Cananeos, um, or Canaanite. However, the term really has no relationship to the geographical term for Canaan. Instead, it is derived from the Aramaic term for an enthusiast or a zealot. So Simon received his call to the apostleship along with Andrew and Peter, the sons of Zebedee, Thaddeus and Judas Iscariot at the Sea of Tiberias. He was Galilean, but the, those terms, Cananeos and zealot, speak of political affiliation. He was, the, he was the member of a faction that bitterly opposed Roman taxation. Josephus, the Jewish historian who was himself considered a traitor to the Jews because he had defected to the Romans, wrote that the zealots were a fourth party of the Jews. So there was the Pharisees, there was the Sadducees, there were the Essenes, and the zealots fought for liberty and said that God is the is to be the ruler is to be their ruler and lord which might sound familiar to you they took the sword and were prepared to face any kind of death for their country and and their struggle for freedom they would not call any earthly man king and would even turn to assassination 
to rid Israel of foreign rule. And so for Simon, it was awkward that Jesus brought Matthew, the tax collector, into the fold. Because anywhere else but in the company of Jesus, Simon may have struck Matthew down with a dagger. And so here we have a case to demonstrate that people who hate each other can learn to love each other when they both love Jesus Christ. Peter often is found at the top of the list of apostles. He's often referred to as ready, fire, aim Peter because he always seemed to speak before he really thought about it. But he was regularly the spokesman for the twelve. And during the days of the early church, he fulfilled Jesus' prediction that he will play a foundational role. And there's Judas Iscariot, who is always listed last. And here is noted as the one who betrayed Christ. uh, Iscariot, or in the the text here, Iscariot, meaning Kyriot, Uh, meaning of Kariot, um, speaks of Judas's place of origin, which was in southern Judah. Judas was the treasurer for this group, uh, a role that someone considered untrustworthy should never be given. So we could assume that he was well thought of by the others, at least until his treachery. Others of the twelve were ordinary people, fishermen and tradesmen. So, Up to this point in his gospel, Matthew had introduced only five of his named disciples. Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew. But here he names the entire group. The New Testament itself does not tell us very much about these men because it is the work and not the workers that should be glorified. While we do not know much about them, the New Testament is very conscious of their greatness in the church. The book of Revelation in chapter 21 tells us that the 12 foundation stones of the holy city are inscribed with their names. These men, simple men with no great background, men from many differing spheres of belief, were the very foundation stones on which the church was built. It is on the stuff of ordinary men and women that the church of Christ is founded. There are three accounts of the calling of the twelve in the Gospels. There's one in Matthew, there's one in Mark, and there is one in Luke. Now looking at each, we learn some interesting things. First of all, Jesus called them out from all his other disciples. Plenty of others followed Jesus, but it was from that group that Jesus called out his main twelve. Most people were not, were not following Jesus at all times. They would come when convenient and then leave when it was inconvenient. But these were probably the 12 who stayed with Jesus even when it was inconvenient. The fact is that he also called them. Jesus does not compel us to do his work. Instead, he offers us work to do. Jesus does not coerce, but he invites. Jesus does not make conscripts. He seeks volunteers. As it has been put, we are free to be faithful. And that means we are also free to be unfaithful. Many will be unfaithful like those who were with Jesus when it was convenient. But as with the disciples, there are a few who will choose to be faithful. In regards to the office of apostle, Jesus appointed them to the office. It's an office that is no longer occupied because Jesus is no longer appointing people to that office. The purpose of the office has been fulfilled just as Jesus fulfilled his own office. However, Jesus is still appointing people to service as a general allocating tasks to his commanders. Sometimes that appointment comes in the form of being aware of a need. And we can either say yes, or we can say no. Verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent out And commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. 
Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. Now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Christ's commission to these 12 men is not our commission today. He sent them only to the people of Israel. And we will see in a, in a verse or two, his instructions were, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as verse 7 says, these men announced the coming of the kingdom to the people of Israel. Sadly, the nation rejected both Christ and his ambassadors. Though not all did, the church started out all Jewish. But overall, Israel rejected Christ, and, and the church saw more and more Gentiles being saved. But of course, we're, we are getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. That, that all comes later. Now, looking back to Jesus' instructions, the apostles depended on the hospitality of others as they ministered from town to town. In those days, for a town to refuse a guest was a terrible breach of etiquette. Those who welcomed the apostles were equated with being worthy. That is the Greek word axios, meaning something evaluated and found to be worthy. The apostles were to remain only with those who received them. That is, those who trusted Christ and received his message of peace and forgiveness. If a town rejected their words, they were to warn the people and depart. In verse 14, Jesus instructs them that if their message is rejected in a certain place, they were to shake off the dust, which was a symbolic warning of coming judgment. What's interesting here is that this evangelistic campaign was not a declaration of the full gospel message, as Christ has not yet been crucified and resurrected. Rather, it was of the Messiah being present at that moment in Israel. Also, we do not know how long this evangelistic campaign lasted. As we'll see in chapter 11, Jesus himself went out to preach. And Luke 9 tells us that later the apostles returned to him and reported what had happened. Mark 6 verse 7 tells us that Jesus had sent the men out in pairs, which explains why their names were listed in pairs here. While we may learn from the spiritual principles in this paragraph, we should not apply these instructions to our own lives. The Lord's commission to us, which we find in Matthew 28, includes all the world, not just the nation of Israel. Also, we preach the gospel of the grace of God, as Paul expressed to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. Having cited the chains and tribulations that, that marked the ministry, Paul told them in Acts 20, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Our message today is Christ died for our sins and not the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is because the king has come. He has already suffered. He has already died and he has risen from the dead. And now he offers his salvation to all who will believe. Let's read on verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, 
but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver up brother to death and a father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, for he who endures to the end will be saved, or but he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another, for assuredly I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So the Lord now moves to speaking about persecution, although we have no evidence that the twelve suffered persecution during this particular evangelistic event. So then, here Jesus seems to go beyond the current campaign to when the apostles would be preaching after Christ's ascension to heaven. I say that because as compared to the previous section, Jesus here speaks of ministry to the Gentiles. Jesus speaks of the help they would receive from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet been given, yet Jesus here talked about the Spirit speaking in them. Also, verse 22 seems to indicate a worldwide persecution, yet the apostles were ministering only in their own land. Finally, Matthew uh, verse 23 speaks about the return of the Lord, which certainly moves these events into the future. So then it seems fairly obvious that these instructions apply to the witnessing ministry of the apostles at a future time. Some of these events are recorded to have taken place in the book of Acts, but not all. In fact, the first part, verses 16 through 20, seem to apply that the period and perhaps into the later church age continuing into the second part. And the second part, verses 21 through 23, seem to apply to a later period that culminates with the return of Jesus, namely the tribulation period. Jesus will later speak in greater detail of, these, of this time of tribulation in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25. In fact, the statement, but he who endures to the end will be saved, here in verse 22, occurs also in the Lord's prophetic Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. The statement does not refer to a person keeping himself saved, but rather enduring persecution and being faithful. Given that these instructions apply certainly to the ministry of the apostles into our time now and then into that future time of tribulation, we can easily understand why Jesus said so much about hatred and persecution. The apostles all suffered tremendously for their testimony of Jesus, as well as Christians at various times throughout the years. And Christians still suffer tremendously in many places around the world today. And I think we can all feel that current events seem to indicate increasing persecution on the horizon, even in places where Christians were afforded safety and freedom prior to now. And then the tribulation period will be a time of intense persecution, like uh, intense persecution opposition, like, like never before seen. God's servants will be like sheep among wolves. They will need to be tough minded, but also they will need to be tender hearted. And this opposition will come from popular religion, from government. And as we see in verse 21, it will come even from the family. While the apostles later experienced some of this, and believers in scattered parts of the world today are experiencing some of this persecution, the indication is that this opposition will be worldwide during the tribulation. As we observed not so long ago when studying through Revelation, in the last days, government and religion will work together to control the world. Revelation 13 describes a time during the tribulation period when a world ruler, the, the Antichrist, will force the world to worship him and his image. He will control world religion, economics, and government. And he will use all three to persecute those who stand true to Christ. There will also be a, a decay of family love and loyalty. In verse 21, Jesus quoted Micah chapter 7, verse 6, to prove this point. There it says, For son dishonors father, daughter rises against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. The three institutions which God established in this world are the home, human government, and the church. In the last days, all three of these institutions will oppose the truth instead of promoting it. 
However, the tribulation period will also be a time of opportunity. That's because tribulation saints, those who were saved after the rapture of the church, will be able to witness to governors and kings. Their enemies will try to impede them and confuse them. But the Spirit of God will teach the witnesses what to say. I hear people today reference verses 19 and 20, which say, Do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. I hear people today use that as an excuse for continued ignorance about God's Word. It's a mistake and it's laziness to use this as an excuse not to study the Word in preparation for witnessing, for teaching, and most certainly for preaching. These verses prescribe an overwhelming emergency situation. They are not God's regular, everyday pattern for us. As we see in Acts 4, even during the days of the apostles, the Spirit gave them, gave, gave them their, message, their messages when they, uh, when they were facing their enemies. Acts 4 is one example. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So during the tribulation, even though judgment is coming and the church has been raptured, God has not abandoned the tribulation saints. They endure to the end and faithfully perform their duty, even if it costs them their lives. In spite of scourging, rejection by their family, persecution from city to city, and trials before leaders, the servants will remain true to their Lord, and their witness will be used by God to win others. In fact, the Bible says that great multitudes will come to Christ. Even though these instructions from the Lord apply to a later time, it is important that we study, remember, and hand them down. These words will become very precious and meaningful to witnesses during that time. But also we today can learn from these words. No matter how difficult our circumstances may be, we can turn opposition into opportunities for witnesses, for witness. We can trust the Spirit of God to help us remember what the Lord has taught us as we have studied and and learned His Word. Instead of fleeing and looking for an easier place, we can endure to the end, knowing that God will help us and will see us through. All right, verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. Jesus has presented truths that seem to apply to the time of the apostles as well as the time of the tribulation period. Here, while the truths Jesus shares would apply to God's servants during any period of biblical history, they seem to have a special significance for the church today. The emphasis is, do not fear which is repeated in verses 26, 28, and later on, of course, 31. What fear is this? Well, we have that answer later in verses 32 and 33 that we'll get to. It's the fear of confessing Christ openly before men. According to Romans 10, the public confession of faith faith in Christ is one of the evidences of salvation. There is an initial confession but it's also a confession that occurs often throughout one's life as people ask what you believe or the reason for your hope. Several reasons show why we do not have to fear to openly confess Christ. And they're expressed here in chapter 10. For one thing, our Lord knows how it is. He's experienced far worse than we ever will. Men persecuted Jesus Christ when he was ministering on earth, so there's no reason for us to expect anything different. We are his disciples, and the disciple does not outrank his master. People who accuse Jesus of being in league with Satan, and people say the same thing about his followers. However, 
Acts 5 and Philippians 3 indicate that we may count it a privilege that we may suffer for our Lord and suffer with Him. Another reason is that we are speaking the truth. The enemies of Christ use sneaky, underhanded, and deceptive means to oppose the gospel. But believers can be open and courageous in their lives and in their witness. We have nothing to hide, and the truth will always become known. Jesus said in John 18.20, In secret I have said nothing. False witnesses lied about Jesus during his trial, but God saw to it that the truth came out. In Romans 2, Paul wrote that God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. We have nothing to fear because the Lord will one day reveal the secrets of men's hearts and expose them and judge them. Our task is not to please men, but to proclaim God's message. The present judgment and opposition of people does not frighten us because we're living in the light of the truth of the gospel of God. Verse 28 says, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So as we see in verse 28, another reason not to fear is because all that men can do is kill the body. And if they do, the believer's soul goes home to be with the Lord. But God is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Now, of course, God will never condemn one of his own children. John, uh, Jesus in John 5 said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And Paul wrote in Romans 8, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The person who fears God alone need never fear any man or group of men. The fear of God is the fear that cancels out all of their fear. Verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Sparrows were the poor man's offering at the temple, and they could be purchased in the market for very cheap. And if we compare these verses with Luke 12, 6, we see that sparrows were so cheap that the dealer actually threw in an extra one. So sparrows were not of high estimation, yet the father knows when a sparrow falls. If God cares so much for his sparrows, will he not care for his own who are serving him? Well, the answer is yes, he will. To God, we are of greater value than many sparrows. God is concerned about all of the details in our lives, and there is no need for us to fear when God is exercising such wonderful care over us. Verse 32, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. To confess the Lord Jesus Christ means much more than to make a verbal statement. It also means we are living out what we say verbally with our day-to-day lives. It's one thing to say Jesus Christ is Lord. Even Kenneth Copeland does that. But it is quite another thing to surrender to him and to obey his will. The walk and the talk go together. In heaven, Jesus has two special ministries. As our high priest, he gives us grace and keeps us from sinning. As our advocate, he forgives and restores us when we do sin. 1 John 2 says, My little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So 
what is this confession or denial before the Father that Jesus speaks of in these verses? Well, for one thing, a person who has not confessed Christ as Lord and Savior is not saved, and his or her name is not in the Lamb's book of life. That person does not have Jesus as their advocate before the Father. But if we are saved having confessed Christ, then even if we sin as being unfaithful, 2 Timothy 2 says that he, that is Christ, remains faithful. But there are benefits of his heavenly ministry that are for those who are faithful to him. 2 Corinthians 5 and Romans 10 speak of one day that we will stand before his judgment seat where rewards will be distributed. If you have denied him, you will lose rewards in the joy of hearing, well done. To be sure, anyone who denies him on earth may be forgiven. Peter denied the Lord three times, was forgiven and was restored. Verse 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Once we have identified with Jesus Christ and confessed him, we are involved in a war. God in Genesis 3 declared war on Satan, and that is the war that we become a part of. On the night that our Lord was born, the angels declared on earth peace. But here Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now had Israel accepted him, he would have given them peace. But the people refused him, and the result was a sword. However, We come out very well in these circumstances. Instead of there being peace on earth, there is peace in heaven. In other words, as the letter to the Colossians spells out, Jesus has made peace through the blood of his cross so that man can be reconciled to God and to each other. The only way a believer can escape conflict with the fallen world and the God of this fallen world is to compromise his witness. And this would be sin. It is certain that we will be misunderstood and perhaps even persecuted, even by friends and family, yet we must not allow this to affect our witness. And remember, when we suffer for Jesus' sake, it should not be because we ourselves are hypocritical, angry, or even difficult to live with. There is a difference between what Paul in Galatians 5 called the offense of the cross and just being an offensive Christian. Each believer has to make the decision once and for all to love Christ above all and take up his cross and to follow Christ. To carry the cross does not mean to wear a pen on our lapel, to wear a bracelet, or to put a sticker on our car. It means to confess Christ and to obey him in spite of shame and suffering. It means to die to self daily. If the Lord went to a cross for us, the least we can do is to carry the cross for him. Verse 39 presents us with only two alternatives. Spare your life or sacrifice your life. There is no middle ground presented here. If we protect our own interests, we will be losers. Not in regards to eternal salvation, but in regards to joy and ultimate rewards. If we die to self and live for his interests, then we're winners. Spiritual, since spiritual conflict is inevitable in this world, Why not die to self and let Christ win the battle for us and in us? After all, the real war is inside. Selfishness versus sacrifice. Verse 40, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. But he who who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. 
And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. A couple of things to consider here. The phrase, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me, does not speak of receiving salvation. Salvation is not received by opening one's door to a missionary or an evangelist. Salvation is by grace through faith. And this harkens back to the idea of ambassadors. Being hospitable toward an ambassador of an earthly king was as, was as if showing honor to the king himself. Likewise, hospitality toward an ambassador of the king of kings demonstrates a honor to God. Now, with verse 41 in the prophet's reward, the idea is this. God allows us to share and the reward of God's servants by supporting them in their work. In fact, even something seemingly insignificant like sharing a cup of water will not be overlooked by God. Little ones, mikros uh, in the Greek speaks of those who are small and relatively powerless. It points back to the sheep Jesus would send out as sheep in the midst of wolves. It spoke of Jesus' immediate disciples who, as his apostles, would initially take the gospel out into the world. They would be received by some, they would be rejected by others, even to the point of being martyred. Those who welcomed them would receive a blessing. Not everyone will reject the witness of Christ's ambassadors. There are those who will be welcoming and they will receive a blessing. After all, They are the ambassadors of the king. Our king will see to it that they were rewarded for what they do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. Of course, we thank you for your mercy. Your name is holy. We pray that your name would be holy, demonstrated in our lives, that your name would be demonstrated as holy in all this world, by the actions of your people. We pray that your name would be holy to the leaders of this nation and all nations. We pray for them, Lord, that they would rule righteously. As a church body, we desire your kingdom. We seek to do your will. Lord, you have provided. We know that you will continue to provide according to our needs, and according to your will. And we thank you. As you love us, teach us to love one another. As you have forgiven us of so much, help us to forgive one another. Lord, I pray that we would have our treasures in heaven instead of seeking after ourselves here on earth. We ask that you would establish us in all of your good things. Guard our hearts, keep our hands from our enemy, the devil, Protect us from his deceptions and his snares as we endure trials. Lord, help us through them. And may you be glorified in our trials. Lord, we place ourselves before you, desiring to do your will each and every day and lead us in victory. And Lord, as it is your will, use us to spread knowledge of Jesus Christ to the unsaved world. May the Lord bless you, and may He keep you. May He make His face and His light to shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance, His peace upon you. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, it's Jesus, the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's message from the Bible. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the end result of sin is judgment and condemnation. But God graciously provides the means to you to be forgiven and to be saved. And that is by faith in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, taking the punishment that you deserve. The Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You receive the free gift of salvation in Christ by faith. 
The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've done terrible things in my life, but I know that I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter what you have done, you can be too. For the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So please, don't put it off. Take this moment to confess Jesus. Thank you for listening. Remember to be a doer of the Bible and not just a hearer. That means demonstrating God's love to others as He has so abundantly poured out His love into your life. Most importantly, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? It's the most important decision you could ever make. Choose your destiny. Don't let the world choose it for you. The Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Go to calvarybirmingham.com and click on God to learn more about God's plan for your life. If you prayed to receive Jesus through this program, please let us know. Go to calvarybirmingham.com and select contact. While you're there, please consider sowing into this ministry by selecting donate. You have been listening to Grace Hope Love with Pastor Sean Bumpers and Calvary Chapel Birmingham. Thank you, my friend, for your fellowship, and may the Lord abundantly pour out His grace, hope, and love into your life.